This is an album launch for the band Stare. The album was made in 1992, but never released till now. But if we were making this film in 1992, we'd only be telling half the story. So we're making it now. A film about Richard Hamilton and his music career. A man who's added so much to the local scene. Let's start with the launch and work backwards. The last gig I played was, I think the last gig we did was the Arts Centre in Norwich and that was 1992. There's two people coming on stage tonight. I have an alter ego. He's asleep at the moment, but he is available for interviews. This is going to be a who's who of Norwich. There's going to be the police. Is your auntie Pat coming? Yeah, auntie Pat. Now my t-shirt, right, it's got, it's got a wonderful, it, you know, it, it smiles all on its own, you see? Um, if you sort of, uh, are you coming to see Star? Star? That great man, Star? <laughs> There's so much to the Richard Hamilton story that we went to meet him at home a few days later. Hello everybody, how are you? Come on in. And left him a camera to tell the rest of the tale after we'd gone. The music room's in there. We've got a wife outside. Kathy's hey. sitting on the stairs. There she is. It's my studio. Hello, I'm Richard Hamilton. I was born on the 17th of November 1957 in Galston, Great Yarmouth. I wrote my first song at seven years of age. It was called Flap Your Wings. I then went to senior school and the guy at um, school, my music teacher, John Roper, I mucked about a lot of school, I got in a lot of trouble. And um, I was always just in trouble. And, but he saw a side of me, a musical side, that you know, he, he used to, to, to get the better out of me. Well, I went to college and I met my best mate, Bruno, and he was a guitarist, he was clever, he could do everything. And punk rock came along, I thought, how can I compete with that? So I bleached my hair, because that was my way. He would never do that, and I would. So I bleached my hair, and I was the first person in Galston and Great Yarmouth to do it. So I was punk rock, and then I thought, right, now, I still haven't got a, got a band, what else do I need? So I bought a van. So that got, you know, that was two big ingredients to getting in a band. And then when I knew my mate Dave had a PA, that was it, I was in. Then I had to learn how to sing. That, well, you know, as in a punk rock way, and we formed a band called The Needles. And we played, um, uh, we played places like Acol, Village Hall. We got 150 quid, we packed it out because everyone wanted to see what punk rock was about. I got hit in a shop in Yarmouth by a bloke because I wore a shirt with badges on it because he thought I was, I was offensive and disgusting. He whacked me around the head and I only went down the steps to Arnold's, the department store. And we started writing songs and we got our first single out, which was Got to Know Ya. And we went up to Radio One, walked into the office, walked into all, where all the producers were and there was a set of cubby holes, you know, just wooden cubby holes. And we thought we'll put one in there for John Peel, we'll put one in there for Richard Skinner, he just did it. And then their producers come out and said, hello, who are you? I said, uh, my name's Hammy, I come from Galston, I'm in a band called The Needles, we're great. Oh really? Well, we'll have a look at your record. Because we were the first band in, I believe, Norwich and Great Yarmouth to, to have our own record company and put our own record out. But that was all we lived for, it was like religion, every day was music. Wow, look at this. This is real memory lane. I haven't been here in 30 years. This is where we first did our first ever gig. We were called The Needles. We supported a band called The Crabs. We got paid 45 quid. We wrote our own songs. Best song was Home Radio. And on the last song, a girl honestly laid on stage in front of me and said, take me home with you. I want to talk to you about some of my influences, the bands that moved me. I grew up 
during the cheesiest music time there ever was. Glam rock. Yep. Mud. The Rubettes. Kenny. But there was one band that took the tongue out of the cheek of glam rock with a stunning album. Roxy Music, for your pleasure. My sister introduced me to this band by saying, look, just watch Old Grey Whistle Test tonight, up past 11 or whatever it was, they're on. Get the Elizabethan tape recorder ready, hit record. So I did. I was blown away. Absolutely blown away. Songs like Do The Strand, for your pleasure, but for me the best song of the lot was Editions Of You. And some of my lyrics and some of my mannerisms in the records I put out, I'm afraid, are from Brian Ferry. Well, Roxy Music was great, changed the day, but then Brian Eno left the band. And that was like, Robbie leave and take that for me, or whatever. Well, it was a lot more important than that, actually. And um, it made me realise I was still looking for something even more experimental. And there wasn't, you've got so many experimental bands now, you can go any direction you like, but you had disco, rock, pop. And Roxy Music were art school. Well then Brian Eno came out with this amazing album. Here come the Warm Jets. Some of these fantastic songs. Babies on Fire, Blank Frank, and here come the Warm Jets. This is the Buzzcocks, their first album. Another music in a different kitchen. Every one of these songs, Fast Cars, Love Battery. I'm even saying it like, Love Battery. Purple Rain by Prince. Fantastic album, that just changed all the rules about playing funky and groovy and disco-y. You know, it's cool. Diary after diary after diary. This is my little history from 1974 to the current day. I was quite obsessive. I still am. These are like graphs of weather, money earned, national insurance, Days off, the maximum miles per hour I went on my motorbike, petrol cost, my weight, uh, it was, it's just endless. I think why our music was popular is because we were very aware. Everything that went on around us, from punk, it went into New Romantic. So we got the tea towels out, we got the makeup, we did the clothes and everything, but equally, we bought, I bought a synthesizer. I went to Yugoslavia on a motorbike, which no one did at 19 years of age. So therefore, our band was called Red Star Belgrade. Brought out the single Too Far, which was synthy guitar-y. Sent that into Radio 1, Blanket Plays. Got a Radio 1 session. We were always commercial. Everything I've ever done is melody-based, but we'll dress it up with the guitars of the day. We had eight singles out over this period and everyone got on Radio 1 and had we had the backup, because we lived so far from the scene, had we had the backup of a record company, everything would have, would have, you know, took us a lot further. We were journeymen, but we worked stupidly. I, I got married and the day after I got married, we were on the beach at Yarmouth having photographs taken. Do you know, I got on my motorbike in November 1977 and drove on a Thursday night to Leeds to get a ticket to see the Stranglers, the Drones, the Saints, and then rode home that same night. So I started out at about four and got home at about 11, just to get two tickets. And then on the Saturday, I rode to Leeds again to watch it. Commitment, that's what we did in the punk rock days. December the 5th, 1977, this was when I was sort of in a full punk rock mode, but we said things a little bit differently then. Went to the Floral Hall in Galston, all punked up. I was very punky that night, but there was no punks there and the music wasn't very punky. Boring. Saturday, December the 24th, 1977, I got in my little mini and I drove to Cromer, to Cromer Links Pavilion. <sighs> the Sex Pistols, they were called Spot Sex Pistols on tour. It was absolutely brilliant. I went to the toilet and Sid Vicious came out of the toilet and it was like, ah. hang on, Kathy's potatoes are on, just a minute. We felt we were getting on, we'd hit 30. We suddenly thought, 
how can we represent anything anymore? We were influenced by a band called Diesel Park West, who were clever and interesting with the guitar pedals. We got Derek and Carl in to try and freshen it up, send the cassette away to the Mean Fiddler. Just to get a gig, he jumped up and down and sent it to Gary Crowley at Greater London Radio, and he entered us into the demo clash without us knowing. And for three weeks running, we won it, hands down. And we didn't even cheat and vote ourselves. We didn't even know we were in it. We signed to Big Life, who had not really done indie. They had, they were a lot more into dance music. They had Della Soul and things like that. We wanted to try it. In 1992, they wanted to discover music big time. And we were the first city in Norwich to be chosen. Not Liverpool, not Manchester, it was Norwich. And they descended on Norwich, took over the waterfront, put on big bands, and every venue, every pub, every cafe on the street, it was like Edinburgh, the Fringe or something. Everyone was playing. There was musicians and music people everywhere. And it all got broadcast live on Radio 1. And they used our single stare as the theme tune all over Radio 1 on every show you heard and live coming from Norwich, the first ever Sound City, and it was with our single stare. Stare.indie.rock. I think I'm a lot better looking now, like a wine, don't you think? <laughs> and then we were dropped. <laughs> well, it was just that the single stair came out, it wasn't barcoded. It had registered enough to get to go in at 22 in the charts. We should have done Top of the Pops, but we sold no records, apparently. And that took the wind out of the sails with Big Life. They dropped us, and it was a waste of a great album. We'd spent seven weeks in Bath recording the album. It was produced by a good producer, and it, had full of, it was full of good, good songs. Suddenly, 20 years on, I get a call from Kingsley Harris saying about an album called The Ugly Truth of Norwich. We said, well, we're out of publishing with Stare, our famous song. Do you want it? And he would jump up. He said, you're joking. He said, what happened to your album? I said, I never got released. Just sits there. I'll put it out. 1977, I had a TIAC reel-to-reel tape recorder. You plug a microphone in, you record on one channel, you bounce to the other while you mic onto that. I was d interested in recording. I remember when I was 13 going down Galston High Street and looking in Hughes and seeing a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder with two tracks, left and right, and I thought, they do left and right, why can't they do more than that? Why can't they have loads of them? I then bought the first ever Porter Studio, 144. I bought a Fostex A8, I had to have one of them. I fell in love with equipment and I wanted the music to sound better. I was working offshore, I had 34 grand a year in 1985 or six, and I left it to go on the dole. But that was when I started recording and I started with some friends of mine who were called Three Rivers at the time and became the Catherine Mill. Got a unit over in Great Yarmouth and um, suddenly it started from there and Purple got bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, I've had some very famous work experience, experience people, Justin Hawkins, three months. We were getting every week Radio One Place and a lot of bands recorded with me because it just sounded good, it just all went together. And then I decided to come to Norwich because I wanted a church, so I got a church. Purple. Spent 11 years here, hidden away in that church. Come back in the mornings, there'd be bands asleep in the graveyard and everything. It was a nice place to come and record at. 35 years ago, when multi-track recording wasn't available to the masses, I used to have an old reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. And I used to record by bouncing from the left to the right, the left to the right, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, building up a song. It sounded rubbish. Well, here now I am actually going to record from one side of the Atlantic to the other with a friend of mine in uh, Huntington Beach, Andy Harris, and we write for the Profumo Project. And we're currently working on a new song called I Gotta See You Ray. And he's got a guest guitarist in called Ian. Hello, everybody. Hello. How's it going? And we're doing this via Skype. So, uh, boy, how times have changed. <laughs> 2004, things started to change. People were not interested so much in being in bands. And they wanted to do five or six songs in a day, and I lost the love. I'd had 21 years, I'd done 50,000 songs. I had the Dat Library there, all these. I recorded the Royal Tank Regiment, and I finished on the Manic Street Preachers, which was great. And then I got a call from my mate Andy in America. Will you come across and record my album for me? I'll pay. And then it went from there, and he knew a friend who wanted some, a film uh, track. So we wrote a film track for a film called Wilson Hill, which I'm working on at the moment. I spend 14 hours a day in here. And when I'm in America, as soon as it gets light, I get up and go downstairs, and I've got the headphones, and I'm on it. This is how my life goes. 
I move my phone along the bench and the mouse needs putting over there. I have a song for everything I do around the house. I'm cooking, I'm singing a song to it. Honestly, I just have to do it all the time. And Kathy, my wife, is brilliant because she loves it as well. And that is how the Profumo project, the final project I'm working on, came along. Hey, we're in our little studio here. Kathy's doing some vocals on a track called Beautiful Place, which we hope is going in a film called Bloody Mary. See what you think of some of this. <laughs> So that's the end of our attempt at videoing. Just like I say, before it goes, before it ends. Me and Kathy met at Purple Studios. I was playing bass in a band called Scarlet and um, I went across to the studio just to say hello and introduce myself before we went in to record. And I opened the door and Richard went, God, you're gorgeous. And, and I, I was went, right. I just took one look at him and I went, oh, you've got a mullet. <laughs> I didn't speak to him for about another two years after that till he cut the mullet off. <laughs> so it's been music. Ever since we met each other, it's been music. And we still want to keep doing music. And that's all we'll ever do.